Welcome to This Constitution. I'm Savannah Eccles Johnston. And I'm Matthew Brogdon. Does Lincoln have to step outside the Constitution to win the Civil War? Well, his answer to this is no. The question today is, was that a good answer? So give us some background on this argument from Lincoln. Well, I mean, a popular line is that Lincoln just argued to do whatever is necessary to win, um, which he did do what was necessary to win. But uh, Lincoln's quite careful to couch most of his powers, uh, most of his, his his more controversial actions during the Civil War in, uh, in constitutional terms. So it might be helpful to uh, point out a few of the things he did that are that are considered to be possibly extra or unconstitutional. So he suspends habeas corpus, which means you can arrest people without charging them with a crime or taking them to trial. Uh, he raises additional troops while Congress is not in session and without any additional uh, appropriations. Um, he declares war and as part of that blockade southern ports, uh, institutes a naval blockade and confiscates ships that try to run the blockade. He uh, arrests a number of individuals pursuant to the, the suspension of habeas corpus that apparently didn't commit any crimes, but that he expected to aid the rebellion. So these are just some of the things that Lincoln does even early in his presidency in response to the secession of southern states that people look at and say, gosh, the Constitution doesn't seem to provide any power to do that stuff. So is Lincoln just saying, I can do whatever I have to do? And we almost can't address his actions until we've looked back at Lincoln and realized Lincoln was a Whig. And the, the Whigs were anti-Jacksonian presidential power. And didn't actually wear wigs, and interestingly. Did, yeah. I yes. mean, unfortunately. Yes, right. It's just a stupid name taken from the British. That's so right. he was a Whig. And then he becomes potentially the most powerful president in our history. And maybe help me out. What do you take American Whigs to be? Because I know like Whigs in England were you know, anti-monarchy, pro-parliament. Right. Well, but it's very similar in the U.S. It's uh, pro-Congress as the political body and anti-Jacksonian presidential power and, I, and also later free soil. And so Lincoln is deeply, deeply entrenched in congressional power, anti-Jacksonian power, especially on uh, later on the war front with Polk. So that's the same Lincoln. And I don't think he changes significantly by the time he becomes president, or at least he'll argue it's the same Lincoln. He's, he's believing the exact same thing all the way through. So in the lead up to the Civil War, first he has to win the election, and he does as a minority president. He wins less than 40% mm -hmm. of the direct national vote, which uh, I guess is one of those times, yay, for the Electoral College. So he's a minority president. If you like Lincoln, you should like the Electoral College. Exactly. That's one argument for the Electoral College. Yes. Right. So Lincoln becomes president. And even before he has been inaugurated, seven states have seceded from the Union for fear of what he will do with presidential power. But he's made it very clear in his speeches leading up to the presidency, I am not going to end slavery in the South. I don't believe I have the constitutional power to do so, nor do I think Congress has the constitutional power to do so right now. I'm only trying to prohibit the expansion of slavery into the territories. They don't believe him that he's serious about the limits of presidential power here. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, he does have in mind doing some, some things in terms of policy that are hostile to slavery. Oh, I mean, for sure. Lincoln's, the Republican platform includes possibly banning slavery in, in Washington, D.C., in the national capital forbidding its expansion of the territories, um, treating free blacks as citizens, and giving them passports and other things, including Republicans also thought that um, uh, free people of color who are accused of being escaped slaves should be afforded all the due process rights of the bill, uh, the, uh, described in the Bill of Rights. So that uh, the fugitive slave law is at least procedurally unconstitutional. So that's some pretty significant stuff, but you're right. He says, I don't think we can actually abolish slavery where it exists. And in the first inaugural, he argues this. So maybe this is a good place to start. How in the world does he come around to justifying the Emancipation Proclamation then? Because he eventually does, not even with a congressional statute, just presidential proclamation 
says, this group of enslaved people shall henceforth and forever be free. Right. But he does so strictly on the basis of a military power. He can do this because the nation is in crisis. And in order to bring domestic tranquility, he has to take certain actions. And so it's only in Southern states that have not yet been occupied that the slaves are freed and this will swell the union ranks, et cetera, et cetera. So he actually really limits what the Emancipation Proclamation can do and vetoes or at least overturns two similar proclamations from generals under him Mm -hmm. who are liberating enslaved persons in occupied territories. And he says, no, we don't have the power to do that. It's only in currently unoccupied Confederate territories. So even here, he's limiting it. Right, because in those uh, emancipating slaves in places the Union already controlled, you couldn't argue served any military purpose. Right. Certainly served the purposes of justice. Lincoln says there's no constitutional power in Congress or the president to pursue emancipation on account of justice, but we can pursue it as a matter of military necessity. So that rubs people the wrong way quite often. But it is because Lincoln is insistent that he can only do what the Constitution authorizes him to do. And Congress can only do what the Constitution authorizes them to do. We sometimes forget, I mean, Lincoln had a very expansive power or expansive view of executive power under the Constitution. But, you know, his view of federal legislative power was actually quite limited. Uh, He thought you'd have to be very careful to justify in constitutional terms anything Congress did. So there's a really broad view of executive power that sort of combined with an insistence that the enumeration of powers in the Constitution means something. Federalism means something. The federal government can't just do anything they think is a good idea. That that can sometimes be hard to hold those two things together. But I do think that, in fact, is seems to be his position. Right. So let's let's scoop. Which ironically, is the reverse of the Whig position. Whigs right. thought the federal government can do all sorts of stuff, right? right? This is the party of Daniel Webster and Henry Clay. They thought that they inherited the Hamiltonian view that the federal government could just promote the public interest by and large, especially economically. Uh, while they were quite hostile to independent executive power, Lincoln, by the time he becomes president, almost flips that on his head. He's got a very expansive view of executive power, but wants to really preserve limits on congressional power. Right. And looking in 2024, people tend to say Lincoln was both dictatorial as a president and anti-states rights, neither of which are correct interpretations of Lincoln. So yeah. let's let's jump back. He's inaugurated in January. In April the Civil War begins. And it's not until July that Congress is called back into session by Lincoln to basically ratify all the things you spoke about before, his suspension of habeas corpus, the blockading of Southern Mm -hmm. ports, calling up troops, et cetera, et cetera. So he has to justify to Congress everything he's done by pure executive order before Congress could come in and actually ratify these things. And here's what he says about it why he feels that he can do this. It presents the question whether discontented individuals too few in numbers to control administration according to organic law in any case can always upon the pretenses made in this case or any other pretenses or arbitrarily without any pretense break up their government and thus practically put an end to free government upon the earth. It forces us to ask, is there in all republics this inherent and fatal weakness? Must a government of necessity be too strong for the liberties of its own people, or too weak to maintain its own existence. Mm. In other words, does the Constitution not grant Lincoln the necessary emergency powers to handle an insurrection, a rebellion in the South, even when Congress is not in session? And he says, that's absurd. That's absurd. Any government that cannot sustain itself is no government at all. But if that's the argument, does, is he really pointing to anything in the Constitution or he's just saying that this power is inherent in any government? Uh, yes, he does. He consistently points to the president's duty to put down uh, insurrections and rebellions to, well, in the oath of office, preserve, protect, and defend the U.S. Constitution. Hmm. Later, habeas corpus can be suspended during times of uh, civil disobedience. What is the language? Civil it's disobedience in, or... Invasion or rebellion. Invasion or rebellion. There we go. And he says... This is rebellion. Check. That yeah. counts. So everything he's actually pinpointing to a yeah. specific power in the Constitution, whether that's the oath of office or whether that is the 
uh, ability to suspend habeas corpus, which is actually in Article 1, which he says, though it doesn't specify if it's Congress or the president. Mm -hmm. So he's pinning these to constitutional powers. And he says, because it's rebellion, these powers are triggered. So, uh, so I mean, you're... you're your argument is it's extraordinary circumstances that occasions the exercise of power. Yeah. But the Constitution itself acknowledges those occasions, those needs. So that's so Lincoln's that argument. Right. So maybe it helped to walk through some of those. So uh, maybe we've already talked about uh, emancipation. Right. It's military necessities, commander in chief. Uh, you can confiscate property as a military. You can do all sorts of things um, if it's necessary to, to win in a theater of war. But that only applies in a theater of war and not other places. But maybe some of the others. Maybe I'm kind of interested in how he actually uses the text of the Constitution to justify some of this stuff. So uh, habeas corpus, I yeah. think, is a pretty good one. Um, partly because Lincoln has to face up to a federal court decision that actually says what he has done is unconstitutional. Right. So do you want to start with the story on habeas corpus? No, you start with it because then I want okay. to follow up with his letter to Arrast explaining, explaining himself. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, habeas corpus is an old right contained in Magna Carta, right? Right there on the wall, there's King John signing Magna Carta behind you, over your shoulder. Um, <clears throat> said that no person could be deprived of their life, liberty, or property without due process of law, but uh, they had to be afforded habeas corpus means produce the body. So if you receive a writ of habeas corpus, say you're an executive, you've detained some person you think is being obnoxious or harm to the community, that person uh, can, can ask for a writ of habeas corpus from a court, and you have to take them into court and explain why you've detained them, why the law of the land authorizes you to detain this person of their liberty. Lincoln had suspended habeas corpus, and there is a provision in the Constitution that talks about habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless in times of insurrection or invasion, the public safety may require it. Right. So clearly the Constitution acknowledges you can suspend it, and Lincoln does so. And then he arrests some people, including a man named Merriman in Maryland. That's confusing, Merriman in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And um, Merriman goes, or someone goes on his behalf, to the Federal Circuit Court meeting in, in Maryland, which is at that time, Supreme Court justices would go out into the country and ride circuit. So Chief Justice Roger Taney, same guy who wrote the Dred Scott decision, is sitting on circuit in Maryland. And uh, this, this petition for writ of habeas corpus comes. He actually issues the writ of habeas corpus and explains that the administration's suspension of the writ is unconstitutional. And he's got a pretty straightforward constitutional argument for this. It says, if we read the provision about habeas corpus as in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, that comes right after the powers of Congress in Article 1, Section 8. And if Article 1, Section 8 is a list of things that Congress may do, Article 1, Section 9 is a list of things Congress may not do, prohibitions on congressional power. It's in Article 1, the article that deals with legislative power. So Tawney concludes from that, it obviously is the case, he says, that the intention of this language about suspending habeas corpus is to be exercised by Congress, not by the president alone. And of course, as you pointed out, Congress is not even in session. In fact, Lincoln could call Congress in a session. He hasn't. He's not going to until, I love this, July 4th, 1861. But he deliberately does not call Congress into session and ask for this. He just does it on his own. And Taney says it's clearly unconstitutional. You should produce this man and explain what law he's broken and why he's being detained or let him go. And the administration, of course, ignores him. <laughs> so the question is, how does Lincoln go about, uh, well, A, he's, he's defying a federal court decision <laughs> by refusing to answer this charge. But if habeas corpus is suspended, that means you don't have to explain anything to a court. That's what it means to suspend habeas corpus. So um, he's got to somehow explain how it is that the president's got unilateral authority to suspend habeas corpus, even though, according to Taney, the text of the Constitution seems to point in the other direction. Right. And he's going to explain this very eloquently in a letter to Erastus Corning, which will come a little bit later. Why, why are we reading a letter that Lincoln just wrote to this guy, Erastus Corning? Ah, okay. It's a goofy name. Yes, because it's published in newspapers all over the country intentionally right. by Lincoln mm -hmm. to basically end this argument. Right. And this is one of his standard practices is instead of going out and giving a speech on it, he just 
casually allows his response to an individual to be published in a newspaper all over the country. Mm -hmm. So there's something like 10 million people read this or something, just ridiculous numbers. So it's concerning the uh, arrest of a man named, well, actually, I can't say his last name. So I'm just going to call him Mr. V, who is a- The Landingham. Oh, is that how you say it? The Landingham. All right, sure. Mr. V. I think. So Mr. V. I mean, I'm v, boldly saying that with certainty, but- I just don't want someone to Well, respond. the truth is, this is what I've said in classes for the last 15 years. So we'll just hope it's right. Otherwise, okay, sure. I've, I've deceived a whole generation. The of landing him. All right, sure. He is a pro-Southern sympathizer. And he's not just pro-Southern sympathizer. He's going around trying to convince uh, people to, one, not enlist in the Union Army, and two, to desert the mm -hmm. army. And so a general arrests the guy and throws him in a hole, basically. And you have a group of Democrats who meet together and who say, uh, publish a... a uh, a, uh, a declaration saying, one, we support Lincoln's right to win the war. But it has to be constitutional. And suspending the writ of habeas corpus for Lincoln isn't constitutional. Therefore, he needs to produce this man and uh, release him. And Lincoln is going to respond to this declaration from these Democrats and say, one, I don't agree that it's only a congressional power simply because it's in Article I, it's never specified that only Congress can uh, suspend habeas corpus. And then he clarifies and says this qualifies as a legitimate occasion to suspend habeas corpus because it's during a rebellion. So one, it never says that it's just Congress. And two, it's a rebellion so I can suspend habeas corpus. On that not just Congress point, yeah. I mean, one, one mark in his favor Article 1, Section 9 also, also says you can't grant titles of nobility. Right. I assume that means neither Congress nor the president <laughs> nor anybody else can grant a title of nobility. Right. So he's got a point here. And then he takes it a, a step further and he says, isn't it just as harmful to have someone going around and trying to convince people to desert or not join the Union Army to the cause of the Union as it were if he were to take up arms for the Confederates? Now, he would have committed a crime if he had actually tried to sabotage something. But there's not actually a crime that he's committed by just supporting the Southern cause. Mm -hmm. Which is why, during times of rebellion, when the law might not reach someone that would justify their arrest, the uh, habeas corpus can be suspended and you can be arrested without having necessarily broken uh, an explicit law and thrown in a hole. And then he says something really interesting. He said, isn't it more merciful to arrest this man and throw him in a hole than to have to shoot some young deserter who's been convinced by this man. Yeah, he actually has this very affecting example, right? He says this, uh, people like Vallandigham get some, get some elderly man into a meeting, some soldier's brother or father, and convinces him that the cause is unjust and that, that, that the thing to do is desert. And they write to their son on the front lines and say, you can't do this, this is wrong. And and then the young man runs away, and here we have to shoot this young soldier. And isn't it easier just to lock up the agitator to begin with? Right, and more merciful. Oh, and then he says, he pushes back, a, 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 I guess it's the third or fourth time, against the Democrats here, and says, they're saying that the suspension of habeas corpus is a congressional power and is okay during rebellion, but only in areas where there's actual fighting. Mm -hmm. And this is taking place in the Midwest. And he says... Well, no, but that's, but that's silly. It doesn't say in the Constitution only where the rebellion is actually taking place. If a rebellion is taking place, it's your job to ensure peace across the entire country. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and this man is harming the Union cause and is causing people to not sign up and then to desert. Mm -hmm. And that's leading us to having to kill them for desertion. So in all cases, what I'm doing is constitutional. And then he has this final masterstroke and he points out that the uh, uh, judge who upheld this arrest was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. He says, this is a good Democrat who agrees with me and my interpretation of the constitution. So he points out, I think it's both the general and the judge mm -hmm. who are Democrats in this case. It's important to distinguish too, this suspension of habeas corpus is not the same thing as martial law, actually. No. And this is one place where the, the, the folks he's responding to are a little confused because 
This is just a power to detain people, what we call detention, to keep them from aiding the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he uses examples of like uh, uh, Confederate generals. He says, you know, Robert E. Lee <laughs> was within the reach of the government when it was known that he was going to join the Confederate cause. Why didn't someone lock him in a hotel room for the next four years? Like, wouldn't we all be better off, right. including Kim? Like, Lee would have been better off if you'd done this to him. Anyway, but that's got to be distinguished from another controversy, which was in some cases the Union claimed martial law in areas. Famous case called Ex parte Milligan. Hmm. This guy, Lambden P. Milligan, who had been engaged in what, what amounted to uh, sabotage, trying to free Confederate soldiers from a Union prison in Indiana. And they not only arrested him, but then they tried him in front of a military tribunal and sentenced him to be hanged. And in that case, the court actually says, no, you can't do that. You can detain him to keep him from helping the union cause. But once you've detained him, if you want to criminally prosecute him and you're not in a war zone, right? Indiana's, there's no ongoing conflict in Indiana. You're in, you're in a, you're, you know, you're, you're not out in the theater of war. So outside of the theater of war, if you want to try him, you've got to put him in front of a civilian court. So the civilian courts are open and operating. So the court does draw a line and say the suspension of habeas corpus doesn't mean you can both detain people and then execute them or put them in front of military tribunals. You can only do that in actual theater of war where there's combat going on. So I, I think there are some limits here, right? And right. It, it can sometimes be hard to explain this distinction between the suspension of habeas corpus and, and martial law, which is a much stronger medicine. That's military dictatorship. Right. And in, But in response to all of these controversies, Lincoln will argue, one, Everything I did was according to my understanding of the strict letter of the Constitution. Not and Roger Tanney's. Not Roger Tanney's, <laughs> which I'm not sure anyone should take seriously. And then second, and this is very interesting, he will argue that his flaw may have been being too lenient and not too harsh mm -hmm. in his war powers, in his actions as president. He says, looking back, people may say, why didn't you imprison Robert E. Lee when you had the chance? and not, why did you throw Mr. V mm -hmm. in jail? So one other issue, because we're, we're running short of time, but one other issue, declaration of war. Ah. Lincoln blockades southern ports, including Charleston. Congress not in session. States have declared they've seceded from the Union. He sends a naval blockade. A naval blockade is an act of war. Right? It'd be considered so by any country. Mm -hmm. So Lincoln is engaging in an act of war. He's confiscating ships that try to run the blockade as though war exists, allowing people to take prizes. Right. This comes up in the prize cases right. in the Supreme Court. So the question is, how can a war exist if Congress hasn't declared one? And his answer is, this is a rebellion. This is a rebellion. And there's a really important distinction here. Is this is him putting down a Southern rebellion. He never acknowledges them as a separate country. It's simply a rebellion, and it is the president's job to put down rebellions and to establish domestic tranquility. But that's not the Supreme Court's explanation. I mean, I think Lincoln would prefer to treat rebellion as something different because he does want to maintain the, the Confederacy is not a real country. Right. Um, but the Supreme Court says, well, you can wage war, whether it's a rebellion or a foreign war, it's still war. Um, and normally, if it was an aggressive war, like a preemptive war, yeah, you, you'd need to go to a declaration of war. But the court wants to justify it in the prize cases by saying, if a state of war exists, the president can acknowledge that state of war and then exercise all the powers of the commander in chief as though war, war had been declared. Now, that also means the president can't just go start a war. Right. But if the president finds that the government is in a state of war, then all the war powers attach, even if Congress hasn't declared it. So another one of those interesting situations where Lincoln insists that the Constitution provides for extraordinary powers and the civil war southern secession has triggered those powers but that doesn't mean stepping outside the constitution and in fact this is this is an old debate right uh or is is lincoln using is he appealing to this notion of like prerogative powers dictatorial powers you know from ancient rome when they had to have dictators or even from earlier presidents like jefferson or is he taking a different view of the constitution well and it's distinct from Jefferson completely. And by the way, I think it is important to distinguish the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution and Lincoln's, which is always, I think, a little dis different. Mm -hmm. So 
how is Lincoln answering this question? Does he have to step outside the Constitution to win the Civil War? An answer Jefferson may have given is, uh, yeah. And he thought he was stepping outside the Constitution on a couple of occasions. Or buy land from the French. Right. Yeah. Lincoln never believed that. And I think this is also consistent with his, his view of a limited executive power during peacetime and that which is illegal or unconstitutional being pe- uh, in, during peacetime becoming constitutional and, in fact, required by the Constitution during crisis time. That the Constitution provides emergency powers during very specific uh, situations for a president to handle a crisis. You never have to fundamentally break the law to save the law for Lincoln. And that is so consistent with his reverence for the law. So maybe you can give me a, what's a way of capturing this, this notion that like there's extraordinary powers because it seems like it's a little, a little subtle, right? There's extraordinary powers. Does it matter if we find them in the constitution or if we find them outside the constitution? Yes, I think it does matter. And it's, it's this. The Constitution never has to be broken to save the Constitution. That's not required. 